Well, hello everyone and uh, welcome to TEEPS uh, 2021 Energy Forum. Uh, I'm Alan Rossiter at the University of Houston and I am your host for today. Uh, TEEP or the Texas Industrial Energy Efficiency Program is supported by the State Energy Conservation Office, Texas State Energy Conservation Office and operated through the University of Houston. Uh, uh, session today is on the topic of reducing water use in manufacturing plants. And uh, we have uh, speakers from a number of different backgrounds and uh, I think a very interesting program for you. We have uh, two innovative new technologies from technology providers that we'll be discussing. And in addition to that, we will uh, be presenting um, a software tool that can assist you in managing water balances and identifying opportunities to save water. Um, I will uh, tell you our speakers are Joe Tardio from Aqua Nareda, Kiran Thurumaran from Oak Ridge National Laboratory, and Josh Summers from Voltia. And uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time providing their biographical details or anything like that. Uh, the information should be now in the chat uh, for the link to our uh, webpage for this forum. And uh, all of that information is there along with additional information about the event. The um, Energy Forum is co-hosted by the South Texas section of the American Institute of Chemical Engineers and their monthly meeting will follow uh, immediately after the forum at 6 p.m. The guest speaker at the, uh, at the um, meeting, the monthly meeting, will be Anne Rosenberg, SVP for Sustainable Development at Wood Group, and she'll be talking about Energy 2.0 and the race to net zero and resilience. And uh, everyone is invited to stay for the uh, AICHE monthly meeting if you wish, whether or not you're a member. Uh, so if you do want to stay around after the water forum, please do. I should also mention that AICHE has three sponsors uh, for this event, uh, Atlantium, TLV, and Aquaerobic Systems. Now, Joe, our first speaker, Joe Tardio, uh, will be representing Aquaerobics, so I will not say much about them at this point, but I did want to just say a few words about our other sponsors. Many of you know TLV already. Uh, TLV is a steam system specialist company and an industry leader in providing steam and condensate system solutions that save water, reduce total system cost, improve refining and petrochemical plant process performance, and, ext and extend steam process equipment reliability. They have a support team here in the Houston area, including technical service members who can come on site for system or equipment reviews and steam trap condition monitoring. And uh, we'll be putting contact information for Steve Garrett, who's one of their local reps uh, in the chat. Atlantium uh, designs and manufactures UV systems for water treatment, disinfection and dechlorination. And again, we have contact information uh, that we'll be putting in the chat. Um, so I think, that's all I need to say about that, but I did just want to give you a little bit of housekeeping information. And so uh, during the, uh, the forum, it would be good if you could uh, keep yourself muted if you're not a presenter and also keep your video off just to keep things cleaner. Um, we're keeping things simple this time around and we're just using the chat box for any Q&A. So if you have any questions you'd like to address to the speakers, please put those into the chat. Um, I've already mentioned the speaker bios and webinar details are on our web page and that information should already be in the chat for you. And the final point I wanted to mention, um, I know many of you uh, like to have certificates of participa participation for professional development hours. And uh, we have our system in place again this time. The link is again on the screen and it should also be going in the chat. If you follow that link, it will take you to um, a, a web page which looks like what you see on the right hand side of, of the screen right now and that has links for PDH certificates both for the, the water forum and also for the AICHE dinner meeting and so at the end of the water forum um, the water forum button will become activated and so if you've been through the whole of the water forum and you'd like to uh, sign up for a, um, a PDH certificate or certificate of participation Go to that link, you'll be asked for a little bit of information and uh, the certificate should be delivered to you pretty much immediately. And similarly, at the, uh, at the end of the uh, presentation at the AICHE dinner meeting, the second um, button will be activated and that PDH certificate will also become available. 
So with that background, I'd like to move on to uh, just briefly introduce our first speaker, Joe Tardio, Product Manager at Aquan Arada. Uh, Joe will be talking about reduced life cycle costs and enhanced sustainability of water, uh, wastewater treatment utilize, utilizing Aquan Arada uh, aerobic granular sludge technology. So Joe, I will stop sharing my screen and hand over to you and I look forward to hearing what you have to tell us. Excellent, thanks Alan. Thanks for the invite Thank today. Very happy to be with uh, with you all. Really impressive uh, slate of speakers and agenda. So this is uh, fantastic. Thanks all for joining. Let's uh, get a screen share going here. Okay, so thank you all for joining. As Alan mentioned, my name is Joe Tardio, Product Manager at Aqua Aerobic Systems for the Aqua Narita technology. Today we'll be introducing the technology to you all and giving a, a very brief primer on how it may be used in several industrial applications and what the major advantages of the technology are. So our overview for today, a brief technology introduction, uh, an overview of applications in the industrial sector, then on to the major benefits and advantages of the technology and its implementation, and several, uh, two or three case studies uh, to highlight uh, some of the particular advantages and concluding remarks. So many of you may not be familiar with aerobic granular sludge technology. Uh, and so this is a brief uh, technical overview of, of what it is. So Aqua Narita is, is a technology that in, uh, incorporates the use of aerobic granular sludge uh, into a time cycle uh, system. And this is a biological treatment system uh, that's capable of uh, advanced uh, organic solids as well as nutrient removal. Uh, it is a simple one tank reactor um, system without the need for separate clarifiers or uh, recycle pumping. And uh, it operates based on a timed cycle, which means that the cycles can be either shortened or uh, lengthened uh, depending on what uh, type of uh, loading and flow conditions are uh, present. And as I mentioned, uh, there is no need for uh, recycled activated sludge. So uh, eliminating uh, a great deal of uh, power consumption by virtue of uh, not requiring uh, the sludge recirculation lines as in typical conventional activated sludge. And as we mentioned, uh, conventional activated sludge, we see that sample uh, on the right. This is the, uh, the wastewater uh, technology treatment of choice for secondary treatment for the last hundred years. Um, and so aerobic granular sludge is really the next step uh, in that um, in that um, evolution. So we see an AGS sample on the left here uh, settled over five minutes and a conventional activated sludge sample on the right settled over five minutes. And you could see that uh, even though the concentration of um, sludge on the left is uh, 8,000 milligrams per liter, double that of the activated sludge sample on the right, uh, the settling over five minutes is, is um, a drastic uh, difference. And so what this allows us to do is design these systems at um, a higher biomass, double the biomass of conventional activated sludge systems, and also attain a much greater settleability, uh, which gives us the ability to, um, to design for higher throughput and a much more compact footprint. I'll just show everybody a kind of a video here of what that looks like in, in real life. So we've got uh, a conventional activated sludge sample uh, as well as an AGS sample. And we'll play that here. So our AGS is on the right and our conventional activated sludge sample is on the left. And this is really demonstrating the settleability difference. So when we start our timer, we can see that the AGS sample uh, begins settling immediately. And within 10 or 20 seconds or so, we've achieved a majority of the settled sludge volume uh, that the sample will achieve over a, a, a 30 minute period. Whereas in contrast on the conventional activated sludge side on the left, really very little settling takes place 
uh, over a five minute period and, and really is required to, um, to have that uh, additional uh, 30 minutes in order to reach the same settled sludge volume as aerobic granular sludge. So you can see this is a very powerful um, you know, demonstration of what we're able to do with uh, AGS uh, system in comparison to the typical flocculent sludge. And so as we kind of look at how that uh, applies itself in, in a practical fashion, uh, we look at several different areas of comparison. So first is footprint and kind of um, benchmarking uh, Narita here with other well-known or well-demonstrated treatment technologies. From a footprint standpoint, first, you know, we look at a traditional biological nutrient removal system, uh, which has a very large footprint uh, for achieving those goals. And then we look at something like an SBR, a sequencing batch reactor, which achieves that same goal in about half of the footprint of a conventional BNR, similar with the ballasted flock type system, as well as an IFAS. Uh, and then when MBR came along about 20 or 25 years ago, there was a, another step change from a footprint standpoint, really being able to uh, design based on a very small footprint. Narita uh, matches that, uh, that benefit in terms of a very, uh, very tight footprint, um, very comparable to, to an MBR. And really because they're, those technologies both are designing at a relatively high mixed liquor around eight to 10,000 milligrams per liter. But when we look at the next uh, process comparison uh, benchmark here in terms of power consumption and really a theme of our talk today, uh, we see that the MBR uh, requires a very, very high aeration demand um, in order to not only uh, provide aeration for the biological uh, demand, but also for uh, membrane scouring. And the energy consumption of the other technologies is, is a bit lower than, uh, than that benchmark, but still uh, quite significant. And when we look at Aqua Narita, we can see um, a drastic reduction in, in energy consumption associated with the biological treatment. And so when we combine all of these and, and other costs, including chemical and, and, um, and, and constructed cost, uh, we look at a 20 year net present value and we see uh, an MBR system being kind of a, at the high end of this, uh, the conventional technology is lower. And then over the 20 year life, uh, the Narita coming in at, um, at well below the others uh, in terms of a, a total cost of ownership. And so the next part of the introduction of the technology is understanding how these granules form. And we won't go into much detail on this, but really um, it's kind of important to understand that uh, the granule uh, content is uh, comprised of exactly the same microbiology that traditional flocculent sludge is but it just takes the shape of uh, uh, granules instead of this flocculent dispersed sludge like we see on the left. And the Narita system automatically does this uh, by virtue of, uh, of its uh, operation and cycle structure. And the ways that this, the granular sludge is transformed from conventional sludge are through two selection mechanisms. The first of which is a hydraulic selection where the system is consistently wasting the poor settling uh, flocculent sludge portion um, uh, that is formed in the reactor. And the second is a biological selection uh, of uh, slow growing microorganisms, which is really the key for uh, forming these granules because those slow growing microorganisms and um, one of those critical ones is, uh, is a PAO or phosphate accumulating organisms secrete what we call EPS. And that AP EPS is kind of a biopolymeric substance that acts to agglomerate uh, smaller particles into larger granules. And so this is how the system operates. So it operates on a, on a cycle structure. Uh, each cycle is comprised of three phases. Uh, the first phase is a simultaneous fill draw where the reactor is both taking in raw influent um, as well as displacing treated effluent at the same time. The second phase, uh, once the fill draw phase is completed is the react phase. And this is where aeration takes place. And what's really important to note here is because of these granules, the granules are able to sustain a dissolved oxygen gradient throughout the granule, whereas that allows them uh, to achieve simultaneous nitrification and denitrification. So on the outer portion of the granule where the DO gradient is high, your nitrifiers are oxidizing uh, your incoming 
uh, ammonia to nitrate. And deeper in the granule where the DO gradient is, is very low, but nitrates are being diffused uh, from the nitrification reactions, you've got your denitrifying bacteria that are reducing nitrates to uh, nitrogen gas that leave the reactor uh, via the atmosphere. And so um, in an aerated state, you're able to achieve both uh, simultaneous nitrification and denitrification down to very low levels. And then the, the, the final part, final phase of that cycle is a, a fast settle. So because of the superb settling of the granules, this phase takes about 15 minutes or so. Um, the mixed reactor is allowed to settle and the granular sludge um, settles down to the bottom of the reactor and um, the, the, the uh, reactor is ready for the, uh, the next cycle. The effluent quality that can be attained out of the Narita, uh, we're looking at a BOD and TSS of about 10 milligrams per liter each, uh, fully nitrified, so we're looking at ammonia less than one milligram per liter, uh, total nitrogen of less than three and total phosphorus of less than one. Again, this is all biologically, there's zero chemical added in this process. If tighter uh, effluent is required, uh, we pair Narita with the AquaDisc cloth media filter, which is a nominal five micron um, cloth media filter. and allows us to get down to five milligram per liter BOD TSS and down to 0.1 milligram per liter of total phosphorus. So when we look at, well, what are the applications that this technology is used for? Well, in a broad stroke, basically any application that has used conventional activated sludge based systems like the technologies that we just spoke about a few slides ago. Um, so certainly in the municipal world, we've got um, lots of applications in the industrial world. We're looking at a variety of sectors all the way from food processing, edible oils, meat and poultry uh, to oil and gas, dairy and beverage and pulp and paper and, and a variety of others. And we'll speak about a few today. Again, our treatment objectives uh, on the industrial side, uh, where are we applying the Narita process? Uh, it's in several you know, different areas. Uh, first, where process water makeup uh, is required, could be for in-plant uh, reuse of a wastewater stream, uh, non-contact cooling, uh, irrigation or land application, uh, surface water discharge or aquifer injection of a spent process wastewater, a pretreatment to a tertiary uh, treatment process like a reverse osmosis or ion exchange or, um, or deionization. And then multitude of other beneficial reuse um, applications. And so as we kind of dive into the major advantages here, we'll hit on a few. So as I introduced the technology. We spoke about the simplified uh, construction and also the simplified operation. And when we look at with Narita, one of the major advantages is that everything takes place in one reactor without any sludge recycles. So we're really simplifying, um, you know, both the construction but also the day-to-day -day operation of the system. So we're uh, we're uh, not in need of these selector basins, the anaerobic or anoxic selector basins. We are removing the clarifiers, which really condenses the footprint of the system. And we're eliminating these uh, re uh, recycle loops. So these return activated sludge, as well as the interbasin uh, mixed liquor recycle that's often uh, required to drive uh, the biological treatment processes are all eliminated with Narita. And so by virtue of the adjustable cycle structure that we just spoke about, there are a couple of really key benefits. By treating a discrete batch, we're able to really maintain a very finely tuned uh, DO, or dissolved oxygen residual without over aerating. And this is where a lot of uh, conventional- Socialists, they think every Republican's a racist. This is um, where every, uh, or where many uh, conventional flow through systems um, really have a major downside is that it's very difficult to maintain um, a specific DO set point. So you tend to greatly over aerate, which is a major energy consumption. Uh, even though the cycle structure uh, acts in a batch system or batch structure, uh, the overall system with multiple reactors um, is operating in a, in a continuous flow mode. So 
um, because of that uh, simultaneous fill draw, uh, the influent is equaling the, um, the discharge rate. And the settling of those granules occurs in a quiescent uh, atmosphere without any raw influent entering the reactor. So you're allowed to really get a excellent settling in a very short amount of time. And again, as we spoke about the react phase, uh, duration is flexible to meet treatment objectives. So for example, if the influent is more dilute, the react phase is automatically shortened to meet the treatment objectives and vice versa. If the influent um, is particularly highly loaded from an organic or nutrient standpoint, the react phase is extended to meet the same objectives. And peak flow management. So another benefit of this cycle structure is that uh, with higher flows, um, those cycles can be advanced or shortened to continue to keep up with um, the peak flows without having major peak flow uh, storage and, and other equalization volume required. And so from an aeration efficiency standpoint, this is the point that I was making before. Um, in a conventional system where you're trying to maintain a DO set point in your aeration basins of two milligrams per liter, 65% um, of the time the system is typically able to do that. But in 35% of the time, the system is over aerating. And at some points, uh, you know, you're aerating up to seven or eight milligrams per liter of DO, which is, you know, um, four times what your, um, what your energy consumption should be. And so with Narita, we avoid that. So this is a, a cycle uh, of a, a Narita system. And this is a little busy graph, but just focus on the, the light blue line here, which represents your DO. And you can see here during an aerate phase, your DO is being maintained very, very finely at this two milligram per liter. So it's providing only the amount of oxygen necessary for the biological treatment to, uh, to take place. From a sustainability standpoint, uh, these granules are 100% biomass and grown within the reactors themselves. So they are not externally added. There is no external media uh, so there are no media replacement, media regeneration, media cleaning, as some other uh, different types of technologies require these external carriers upon which the biofilm grows. This is not uh, required in Narita. And also membrane-based technologies where you've got a membrane here that um, you know, can be susceptible to, to um, membrane breakage or failure, sludge bulking, and other, uh, you know, other issues, hair, for example, or other, um, other issues that, are, that clog or, or present an operational difficulty for the membranes. And uh, as well, you know, the, the requirements to chemically clean a lot of this media uh, do not exist with Narita. And then from a water saving standpoint, um, you know, Narita also does not require any sort of backwashing, so you don't, um, you don't end up with, a, uh, with any sort of backwash stream, no chemical uh, cleaning waste volume to deal with, and no media regeneration as we just spoke about. And in some, uh, some technologies, uh, a lot of filter technologies where there's a filter to waste period um, after uh, a backwash to get back to normal operating condition, uh, there is, uh, you're wasting all of that uh, what could be product water, and that does not take place in Narita either. And so to demonstrate this, we have a basic process flow here where you've got your grit removal and screening uh, being sent to the uh, Narita reactors and then any post, uh, post treatment, tertiary treatment. And the only return flow here is from the excess sludge wasting. So there is a waste uh, a sludge waste stream, and this is that lighter flocculent sludge that we spoke about that's continually wasted. Uh, it's sent to a small ancillary um, basin, which we call sludge buffer. It's thickened. Those thickened solids are then handled um, uh, by dewatering and digestion. And that supernatant, which is the majority of that, is recycled right back to the head of the plant. So there is no liquid waste stream here. The only waste um, is this, um, are these solids uh, that are then uh, treated, digested, and or dewatered. So it's a very, very efficient, uh, sustainable process. 
From an energy and equipment reduction standpoint, um, we have actually looked at this quite a bit and have identified the major areas for um, energy savings. And so we can see here conventional activated sludge system uh, on the right, uh, an SBR type system in the middle, and then our aerobic granular sludge system on the left. And we see where uh, much of this power reduction comes from. Uh, several of the key areas, it's the elimination of mechanical mixing. So you'll see this gray bar does not appear uh, with Narita systems, and that's because your aeration system uh, is, is doing all of the mixing uh, of the granules in the reactor. There's no additional mixing required. Your aeration efficiency is also much higher um, with uh, granular sludge than uh, flocculent sludge because the bulk liquid in the reactor is relatively clear. Uh, most of your solids are bound up within the granules themselves, so your oxygen transfer efficiency is much greater. And we're uh, eliminating all that recycled pumping, which in some cases is quite a bit, you know, up to 4Q, you know, up to four times what your feed flow uh, is, which can be considerable amount of pumping energy. And so when we take a look at kind of the, the, the last piece of um, one of the bigger advantages of Narita is the maintenance and reliability. When you look at the tank uh, or the reactor, it operates much closer to a clarifier than a biological treatment system because there are no moving parts within the reactor um, itself. So everything is fixed. The effluent weirs are fixed. Uh, the fine bubble diffusers and the influent distribution grid are fixed. And so there really is no moving parts within the reactor that require ongoing maintenance. And so from a reliability standpoint, um, it, it offers a, a, an enhanced level of reliability. Everything outside or everything requiring uh, maintenance like pumps, valves, blowers, and instrumentation is located outside of the, uh, the tank. And from a process uh, resiliency standpoint, we've actually done quite a bit of testing as well and it shows that granular sludge, and this is well known in the literature, granular sludge exhibits a higher degree of process or process robustness when compared to conventional sludge for many different types of adverse process conditions, one of them being a, a drop in pH. So we've done this testing where we've dropped pH and then brought it back to baseline condition and see, for example, how the ammonia removal efficiency compares and when you can see here the AGS in blue compared to the flocculant in orange, um, the, 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 um, the bounce back uh, on the AGS sample is much greater than on flocculant sludge. This is particularly key in industrial applications where you know, these adverse process conditions um, can occur. And so we're ensuring essentially that we're not killing off the biology here and that normal treatment operation resumes very rapidly after um, baseline conditions are restored. One of the other major advantages here is footprint. And this is just a, a brief example of a plant in Alabama where uh, formerly utilized extended aeration ditches for biological treatment um, and took about two, two acre footprint uh, for a treatment flow of about two MGD, the three and a half MGD peak and installed uh, Narita uh, as an upgrade uh, in about a third of the footprint and is producing about 75% increase in treatment capacity. So they've moved from these extended air ditches along with clarifiers to a three basin system, uh, much simpler to operate, much lower cost from a power and chemical standpoint uh, and, and uh, significantly increased capacity. And then the last portion of our presentation for the next few minutes, uh, we're gonna go through three uh, case studies. The first of which is a commercial application actually treating airport waste, um, high strength waste uh, at a plant in California. And we can see here the influent uh, on the right, uh, highly loaded from uh, an, uh, an organic as well as a nitrogen standpoint. So a, a TKN of about 160 milligram per liter uh, COD, uh, about 1,500 milligrams per liter. And the effluent out of the um, AGS system is excellent. So ammonia, fully nitrified ammonia down to uh, 0.2 milligram per liter, BOD less than 10, TSS less than 10, and total phosphorus less than one milligram per liter, all done biologically with zero chemical addition. 
And we could see here the percentage removals of everything from turbidity to ammonia um, to uh, nitrogen are all uh, in the 95 to 98% range. Our second case study is a vegetable oil uh, refinery. And uh, this was, this Narita system was started up uh, a while ago now, 2007. And this is actually a retrofit of an SBR uh, that had issues with bulking sludge and TSS washout. And this is a consistent issue with, with SBRs um, and any, really any system that relies on flocculent sludge uh, as you tend to get bulking uh, when you've got a higher degree of filamentous uh, organisms. And um, what, during high flow periods, you are washing out uh, your TSS, which in a lot of cases washes out uh, your beneficial bacteria, including your nitrifiers. And so it makes it difficult to achieve your treatment objectives. Uh, this is a highly loaded uh, influence source, uh, influence COD above 5,000 milligrams per liter and a sulfate level of about 7,000 milligrams per liter. And this plant by, uh, by um, retrofitting to AGS was able to quickly um, deal with this TSS washout issue, uh, as well as the performance um, uh, issues that they were having with the previous SBR. And then lastly, we've got uh, the Idaho Springs, Colorado plant, which, is, which takes a blend of municipal and industrial influent this is also a retrofit of existing SBR. You can see the two SBR basins here. Um, and really what drove this was an increasing effluent uh, restrictions, as well as the need to increase capacity within the existing footprint. And so this is a fairly high, highly organically loaded influent because of the brewery and distillery waste that the plant uh, takes on. And so in summary, uh, the Narita system provides a reliable, compact, advanced biological treatment system. There are over 80 plants, 80 Narita plants installed around the world um, or operating or in design uh, with 15 plus years of experience. And really when you take a look at all the costs really is a very compelling from a total cost of ownership standpoint. The footprint and energy reductions are significant um, and the installation costs are greatly reduced, again, by virtue of the fact that it is a single reactor uh, system. And lastly, the flexibility and ease of operation, uh, really having a very limited amount of moving parts within uh, the reactors themselves. And with that, I'll give it over to Alan and the moderator, and uh, we're able to take any questions that anyone may have. All right, and we are running a little bit behind schedule, but I did want to feed one question to you and then just add one comment after that. Uh, the question was from Jack, who's asking whether you can retrofit with this technology. Yeah, absolutely. So retrofits are a big part of, um, of where Narita really shines. And those last two uh, case studies that I showed, the, uh, the vegetable oil uh, and the brewery and distillery waste, both are SBR retrofits with Narita. Okay, so you can reuse a lot of the equipment. Okay, good. The, um, I'm sorry, we, we are actually running behind, but I did just want to mention there was a question in the chat um, about um, the availability of the uh, speaker slides and the recording. And uh, for those who missed it in the chat, yes, uh, the answer is yes. And actually, even if you go right now to the web page and the link is on the uh, uh, chat, you can see the, um, the presentations already loaded on the event web page. And we'll get the recording obviously after this event. And incidentally, also, if you do want to contact Joe, uh, his contact information is also on the website. Um, so uh, all of that, excuse me a minute. Having, looks like my, oh, okay. Sorry, I was running out of power on my computer there. That's, that would not be a good thing. <laughs> so uh, yeah, that, I hope that addresses that question as well. Um, very good. So thank you, Joe. Uh, if you can, uh, we can move on now. Our next speak speaker is Kieran Thuramaru. Thuramaran, sorry. And uh, Kieran, if you'd like to share your slides, Kieran is from Oak Ridge National Labs and has been doing work for the Department of Energy, and he'll be sharing uh, some of that with you. Thanks, Kieran. Yeah, thank you, Alan. Can you, can everyone see my screen? Yes, looks okay. good. 
Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Kiran Tirumaran. I work out of Oak Ridge National Lab, as uh, Alan mentioned. And uh, today I'm going to be talking about one of uh, like the software tools that we developed uh, for the Department of Energy, and it's like the uh, and it's the Plant Water Profiler uh, or the PWP. Um, so you could uh, you, uh, you can like download the software. It's like free to use. It's on the DOE website, or you could just like Google Plant Water Profiler and it should come up in the first few links. Um, so it's an Excel-based tool um, that, is, that is like designed for, uh, primarily for manufacturing plants to do like a facility level uh, water assessment uh, of the plant, right? So water assessment, what we really mean is like uh, these three, uh, three steps um, and uh, the tool kind of like walks the user through all these three steps of baselining the water use at the facility, determining the true cost of water that's being used, and also helps with uh, identifying water efficiency opportunities. Right. So maybe like let's let's go through uh, these um, these like some of these fundamental concepts first, and then dive into some of the uh, key elements of the tool itself. So water uh, baselining water use. Right. What do we exactly mean by that? So baselining water use is pretty much like an end-to-end -end mapping of water flow in the facility. So um, like we would like to know uh, where water is coming from, like where it is like sourced from, how it is getting used in the different system, how much is being used, how it is like recir recirculated and like lost during the production process. And uh, finally, how it is getting like treated and discharged um, at the out outflows, right? So essentially with baselining, water, baselining the water use at the plant, we are trying to address three questions. So that is where water is being used, how much is being used and what is its source and discharge, right? And so what is the significance of baselining your water use in the facility? So this is kind of, baselining would be kind of uh, like your first step in like trying to improve your water performance. Um, it is critical to kind of like baseline it before you can like track the water performance year over year and, and trying to see improvements in it, trying to see if like the water uh, efficiency projects that you're implementing are having an impact on your overall water use. And it also helps you like benchmark against uh, similar facilities across the industries and so on and so forth, right? So uh, the tool does give you kind of like, um, like, a, like a high level benchmark, um, or kind of like helps you start on the benchmarking process. That is, a, uh, I, I will like touch base a little bit more on the benchmarking capabilities of the tool uh, later during the slide decks. But again, you can always like benchmark, once you know what your baseline water consumption is, you can benchmark against like similar uh, facilities within your portfolio. Um, um, yeah. So that's with respect to baselining the water uh, water use. The second one is uh, identifying the true cost of water and the tool helps you um, kind of like um, do that in a streamlined way as well. Um, the true cost of water, what, well, what is exactly we mean by that is uh, like as the name, name sounds like finding the holistic cost of water. So water cost that is not just whatever you're paying to the utility, but everything involved in like um, in like getting the getting water to to its point of use, right? So um, technically, we can like divide it into two costs: the direct cost component, which is which is like whatever you're like paying on the bills to the utility, either for purchasing the water from the uh, municipality or at the discharge site to the sewer, and indirect cost associated with like treating that water um, before it's being used or treating that wastewater, pumping it to the point of use heating or cooling it, depending on what, uh, what temperature is needed at the process and all the chemicals and everything that goes into it, right? So the true cost, um, kind of like, uh, the, finding the true cost is uh, helpful when you are trying to justify water efficiency projects, which might not be that cost competitive if you just uh, use the direct cost. So that is like one, uh, one big uh, utility in knowing the true cost of water being used in your facility. And at the same time, it helps you identify uh, cost intensive systems, right? Um, so if you know a specific system in your facility, a specific production line 
is using um, is using water which is more expensive than other places in your facility you could concentrate your efforts on those systems a little bit more so so that's kind of like the utility or the significance of knowing the true cost of water at your facility so um, just one one other point I would like to add on on the true cost side uh, before I move along is that so true cost is going to be very uh, unique to each each uh, each facility that you have so even if you're operating like four four or five different facilities uh, in different regions and they are all producing the same product or the same chemicals um, still you would want to like identify the true cost by facility because again all these diff cost components could uh, vary quite significantly um, based on how you are sourcing the water how you are treating it so on and so forth so the tool kind of like helps you uh, with both of these two things that we spoke about baselining the water use and um, identifying the true cost of water uh, so the tool as i mentioned is excel based um, it has like uh, 10 major input tabs right so the first eight are shown here the first tab is associated with like plant information so that's just like high level overview information of your plant and you just like choose the different components and the systems in your facility tabs two three and four uh, are associated with baselining the water use um, and tabs five to eight are associated with identifying the true cost of water being used in your facility right and let's go through these uh, in a little bit more uh, detail so Ba baselining water use so baselining water use is actually pretty straightforward or it will be pretty straightforward if you have a really good resolution or really good submetering in your facility right so if you have like uh, submeters on all your production line or at least on all your systems um, then doing a baselining of your facility that end-to-end -end mapping of your water flows is a pretty straightforward exercise but we do we know that it is not always the case in your uh, in your manufacturing facilities right and in a lot of cases it doesn't even make sense to put a meter on on everything uh, it is just not um, uh, cost effective to do that um, so in place of like submetering we need to rely on engineering estimate we'll need to rely on back of the envelope calculations uh, to kind of like uh, figure out uh, the baselining right and and one technique that is really helpful when we are doing this engineering estimate is water balance right and the tool kind of like gives you a easy way to do this water balance uh, for your facility so what do i mean by water balance is it's pretty much as it sounds what we are trying to make sure is if uh, the amount of water being used in like specific systems if you add it up we want to make sure it is equal to your facility input right and if there is a difference between those we know there are then we would know that there are unknown water uses that we are not considering and that we should investigate into. Uh, similarly, we want to make sure the facility input, how much of water coming in, is the amount of water leaving the facility, right? And when I mean leaving the facility, I'm not just talking about the discharge, but also any losses in your processes or water in your products. So we want to make sure um, those are balanced out. And again, if there is a mismatch in this or an imbalance in this, then we know there are like some unknown losses that we are not taking into account and we need to go and find those and investigate that a little bit more. So that's like a uh, water balance. And in order to do that, uh, again, we would need uh, some, some data, right? And the big data points we would need are associated with uh, the facility level data. So amount of water that is coming to the facility and going out of the facility uh, that's being discharged. And that is, um, that is an input into the tab uh, in, in tab two of the PWP tool. Similarly, we will need to know how much water is being used in like specific systems. Um, so when I mean systems here, it could be like say your it could be your cooling tower, it could be a production line. Uh, it is it is what how you want to def define those boundaries, right? So so we want to know water being used in these systems, and that is defined in tab four of the tool. And the tool kind of and the tool kind of like does uh, gives you an easy way an easy interface for you to compare it uh, to see how the water balance looks like right and and know if there are like data gaps that we should consider so that's tab two and tab four tab three is 
kind of like a uh, optional tab so tab 3 has a lot of like uh, again those back of the envelope calculations for specific systems right so it has it uh, it gives you some simple calculators to know how much water is being used in specific systems uh, which you can make use of if you don't know or if uh, if you don't know the exact amount of water being used uh, again these calculators are available for different system types we have one for cooling towers we have separate one for boilers we have one for like production processes that you could make use of. Um, again, these tools are there. If you want to make use of it for to estimate the water use, you can. You can. Otherwise, you can skip these. Uh, skip tab three. So, in lieu of like not showing you the actual tool, uh, I have a few snapshots, uh, images of the tool with uh, which I just put it in here to kind of like give you a feel for the tool, right? And uh, just get you. Um, just to show you how how kind of like easy and straightforward it is. So this is an example from uh, tab two. So this is where we are. Uh, we have our input for the facility level water use, and this is like the first tab that's there. And um, throughout this tool, the 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 color coding is such. Anything that you see in yellow, it's like an input tab. Anything that you see in orange, it's more. It's kind of like a drop down that you can choose from. Um, anything um, that is like brown is kind of like a calculated value. It's like there's a formula behind it, so you don't need to worry about it. And anything in purple is kind of like uh, cross checks, right? The, uh, that kind of like helps you to make sure um, that we are doing those water balances correct. And similarly, any any input tab that you see in the tool, it will also it obviously it has a description to it, and there is a lot of like hints and things like that. Um, that talk about how to fill in this tool. And at the same time, it has this picture on the top right that kind of like gives you a visual on what this table is talking about. So in this case, the ones that are highlighted are, we are like talking about the facility, like the overall plant, and we are talking about the intake water into, into the plant, right? So, so you kind of like immediately know what this tool is talking about and you could like uh, input the data accordingly depending on what is relevant for your facility. So that's tab two. Um, tab three, as I mentioned, these are like uh, optional calculators that we have. And the calculator that I have in, on the screen is one for cooling tower. And as you can see, um, based on like the cooling tonnage, the operating hours, the load factor, and some of the other, um, some of the other parameters for the cooling tower, like conductivity and, and uh, things like that, uh, it, it it gives you an estimate for the amount of water being used in the cooling tower, right? So without without metering the actual cooling tower, you are able to uh, you are able to estimate um, based on based on um, based on the system itself and some engineering calculations. Um, so it's not shown here, but all the all these calculators, if you if you scroll a little to the right in the tool you will see the exact uh, equations that are being used so you could you could um, um, you you could make up a, make up your mind if this is accurate or if you have a better way to calculate these things so so that's with respect to the baselining your water use right um, at um, and at the at the facility level and also at the system level so next we are uh, next thing that the tool helps you with is is determining the true cost of water once you know like the volume of water being used in your facility and the different uh, systems it's used in, determining the true cost of water is going to be straightforward given you know some of the data points that are needed, right? Some of the uh, some of the costs that are needed. So what are those data points? One is definitely the unit cost of all your cost component. Um, so let's say you are getting your water from your uh, utility, you want to know like the dollar per thousand gallons that you're paying. So that's going to be pretty straightforward because that's typically in the bills. But some of the other unit cost components may not be that straightforward. Let's say you are treating that water through an RO system or through an aeration system. The cost of treating like thousand gallons of water um, through that system is not it uh, is not like very uh, is not very straightforward to determine. But that is a data point that we would need, and the tool kind of like has some typical values. Um, that are that are provided for some of the common wa water and wastewater treatment systems that you could use 
um, in case you don't have the exact numbers for your system in the facility. So the, all those unit cost components, th those go into tab five of the tool. And once we have that, it is pretty much a matter of matching these cost components with the volumes of water that we already found um, you in the water balance, right? So those are done in tab six and seven. And tab eight is associated more with uh, so the embodied energy components in the water. So as I mentioned, like you are pumping the water to its point of use. So that's like pumping energy that is being spent and you want to uh, you want to consider the cost associated with the pumping, right? Similarly for heating and cooling. So those uh, things associated with the energy components can be uh, uh, can be calculated using tab eight and the associated inputs. Um, as an example for this, I have a table from tab seven, and uh, this kind of as it's mentioned as seen in this diagram, it is associated with the system boundary, and uh, we are talking about the water treatment uh, aspects within in in your specific systems, right? So based on inputs from your previous tabs in the water balance we have done, it is kind of like going to show you how much water is being used in your in your systems. So here we have product cooling as one of the process. And we also have a cooling tower, which are using this much water. And uh, in this tab, what we are pretty much saying is how much of that water is being treated using which specific system, right? So the product cooling in this case is treated as using reverse osmosis and the cooling tower water is lime softened before entering the cooling tower. So you pretty much like just say what are the treatment associated with these systems. So based on these information, the tool at the back end is going to put a true cost component for each of your uh, specific system that you're defined. So the last step of the tool, and uh, so these are tab, these are in tab nine and 10 of the tool is identifying a water savings opportunities, right? Um, again, this is not meant to be like a full blown kind of like an opportunity assessment for, for the facility but more of kind of like just getting you started on that path, right? So, so these tabs are meant for more like an informational purposes to get your wheels turning on what are the kind of opportunities that we could implement to save water. And the way the tool does it is through checklists. So that is like various checklists in both these tabs associated at, at the facility level and also at the system level that you could go through and answer some of these questions and kind of like get, get an idea on what, what more can you be doing on these specific systems, right? So, that, uh, so that's kind of like the identifying water savings opportunity uh, aspects of the tool. Um, so yeah, so with that, that would end all kind of like the input components of the tool, like from like start to finish. And once you're done with it, and uh, once you have like good inputs for those numbers that you're confident on, um, you, you, you'll be able to like uh, get good results from that, right? Which is like the last tab of the tool. So that was like way more uh, detailed results. There's a lot of, uh, lot of pie charts, tables and uh, graphs that are associated in the results tab. I just like picked a few um, to kind of like give you an idea. Uh, one of the things that, uh, that the tool spits out is kind of like the true cost component, right? And it kind of like splits it up, uh, kind of like breaks it down by process. So for each of the process that you have defined, uh, each of the system, it kind of like gives you a true cost. And further, it breaks down the true cost by what is kind of like the contributing factor for the true cost, right? So for example, in this case, we have process, uh, which is like using also like 90 to $100,000 a year. And we have, uh, we, we kind of like break it down by how much of that is like the municipal water intake, so the utility cost, how much of that is the wastewater disposal and how much of that is like, uh, say, uh, pump, pump, pumping and motor energy, so on and so forth, right? Uh, similarly, we have like pie charts that breaks down, a uh, typical pie charts that you, uh, that you could imagine that breaks down what, um, like water being used in the different areas. It gives you tables of water imbalances. So it kind of like gives you where your imbalances are. And to kind of like, and if, if you find that if there is like a significant percentage of water that is that is an imbalance, you want to kind of like investigate and uh, maybe uh, recheck your numbers a little bit more to make sure it is accurate. 
and also as i mentioned like the benchmarking aspects right so the so the tool has like a database a database of uh, facilities across like different industries for water usage and it kind of like compares it against it uh, to kind of like gives you uh, estimation on where your facility is right i would add the caveat that the database uh, is based on canadian facilities so we don't have a equivalent database for us manufacturing facilities so we just have a backend that is based on canadian data set so i would take those results with a grain of salt but again if you know how much water is being used in your facility if you know the water intensity um at your facility you can kind of like manually compare it against uh, your other facilities or even year over year right to see how you are improving so uh that's the snapshot of the tool itself again i know this is like a very high level uh, overview of the tool i would i do re definitely encourage you to like download the tool take a look at it and uh, yeah definitely like reach out to me if you have any questions i'll be like more than happy to like walk you through the tool and give you a uh, deeper um walk through of the tool itself so definitely get get in touch with me if you have any questions and uh, yeah i hope you um, i hope you found the presentation helpful thanks so much uh, kiran there are a few questions um in the chat here and um uh, I'll be useful if you could just uh, make some comments on these. Uh, mm -hmm. Let me see the most recent one that came in. Maybe we'll start with this one. Um, how do you account for variations in the source water chemistry? Um, is this something that, that you can do within the program? When you, especially when you're comparing sites. So is that... Uh... Okay, how do I... So actually, David, if, David, if you want to unmute yourself, maybe you can... Um, mm -hmm. Pitch your question directly to Kieran. So I'm I'm curious to know is that uh, are we uh, David? Are you concerned about how that chemistry affects your true cost of water, or what what is the concern there? No, but most of uh, industry we use water for uh, it's just cycles of concentration. So we're so we're we're taking the water either in a cooling tower and cycling it up to a certain concentration or or removing uh, impurities, right, mm -hmm. to a fraction and then blowing it down in a boiler depending on the water. So you have to, you have different, you know, you can't compare one site to another when you have different water sources unless your, your software uh, somehow takes that into account. Right, actually, yeah, the short answer is it does not uh, take the, quality of the water into account it only takes the quantity of water into account when we are doing talking about this benchmarking uh, th th so that's why I, I would be a little careful when we when we are looking at some of these benchmarking aspects of the tool right again it, it is kind of like there to kind of like give you a pointer but um, to really do a benchmarking yeah you want to consider some of these aspects just one other point I would add there is like, so if you do have like water sources that are different, that would reflect on your true cost of water because probably you are like treating that water a little bit more if, um, if you like, if the hardness of that water is like higher or things like that, right? Um, so even if you just have that uh, number and you, if you're able to like compare it year over year with the, even within the same facility, then you would be able to like, Make you make use of the tool that way. Okay. Um, there's a question from Alcio, and he asks, um, uh, "What is the ratio of direct cost to indirect cost of your baseline water? Do you have any feel for that, and what would you include in yeah. direct and indirect?" <laughs> yeah. So as I mentioned, like with respect to the components, what you would include and what you won't include, it it like again, dip, dip, it, um. Direct cost is pretty much whatever you're paying to the utility, right? Either at the front end or the back, like for the intake of the district. And the indirect cost could be all the things that we spoke about, like treating Pumps. that water, yeah. yeah, the energy associated with pumping sure. that water, any chemicals you are adding into the water, so on and so forth. And comparing that is actually like, uh, so that is a really good question in terms of what is like typical ratios, right? Mm -hmm. But 
but it, I, I kind of like need to like stick to the typical engineering answer <laughs> saying that it varies because it, <laughs> it, it definitely does vary. And what we find is like, even within like same, within the same industry, it varies mm. quite a bit with, um, b- between facilities, right? Because again, this is like very site dependent, as I mentioned, because one of your five site, you could be getting municipal water. So your direct cost component could be higher. And another facility, you could get, be getting it from surface water, right? right? So all you have is your indirect cost component. So that ratio mm. is going to be really skewed up. But we do see anything from like 1.5 to 3 point. We've seen like four, four times the indirect cost component in the facilities that we have done. But again, the, the, it is very site specific. And the only way you want to compare is with your facility year over year. Yeah. And certainly you showed in those charts that your the program does actually show the breakdown. You can see where mm-hmm. your costs are coming from. Yep. So that, that's a useful pass, pass, uh, capability there. One last quick question, because again, we're running a little bit behind here. But um, Kevin asks um, about, well, let me, let me read the question. Um, the question on the use of this tool with the other better plant software. So what plans are there to extend this tool to include the energy assessment tools in the analysis software? And have any of your program partners asked your program to assess both energy and water in their systems analysis? And just before we go to that, I noticed that within, within the water profile, you have that section where you had um, energy costs, I think it was tab seven you talked about. So to some extent, you've already got the energy costs in there. Right. So yeah, that is a way to include uh, the energy pumping cost or like... Uh, cost associated with the heating or cooling your system with the, to your cost component. But I think what Kevin is uh, talking about here is kind of some of the other analysis right. software tools we have. So one of the big one is called Measure. Measure, you're right. Uh, right. Yeah. So those kind of like are more holistic modeling, energy modeling software for specific mm-hmm. system, right? So like say if you have a cross heating system or if you have a compressed air system, they kind of like give you a whole holistic energy modeling of that. There is like no way for the PWP tool to kind of like talk to these systems, kind of they are built like as like standalone mm. systems as of now. Right. Um, because again, they do serve kind of like little different purposes, right? Mm. And uh, so, yeah, I, so I, I guess that is like the high level answer. Uh, but Kevin, if you, if you want to get in touch with me, if you, if you are looking to do like something specific, we can definitely talk about how to leverage some of these different tools uh, that would fit your purposes. So that sort of leads into the, the final question. I was going to just uh, pass your direction. Do you actually um, do training courses for this as well? Obviously the software is available. You can just download it presumably from your website. Um, but then, you know, what do I do next? You, you actually do two training courses. This was obviously high level, but. Yeah, do you... we do. We do like have done. A, um, so right now, most of our training courses are, kind of like within like the better plants, uh, mm-hmm. like the partners we work with is who we are like doing the training courses for. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you're interested in something like that, again, definitely get in touch with me. Uh, we do have one coming up in, uh, in June. Um, so, so yeah, even if you're not a better plants partner, we can, I, I think, yeah, don't quote me on this. That's maybe something we could, we should be able to. Do. So, so yeah, get in touch with me if you're interested in like training uh, or something similar to these tools. Yeah. Mr. Bruce, Bruce, would you like to say something? Alan, yeah, I just wanted to follow up on uh, Kieran's answer there. Um, sure. We do have what we call in-plant trainings and industrial water efficiency is one of those trainings in which we feature the use of this, uh, this tool. And because of the pandemic, we've turned these into virtual trainings. So, Sure. The course that uh, Kieran's referring to come up in June is going to be a virtual version of our water efficiency implant training. So rather than coming out to the partner site, partners will be able to, to take the course online over a period of several weeks. Um, I, I will say that because we can't come to the plant, there's going to be a little bit more of a onus on the partners themselves to collect data and you know, do a lot of the interviews with operators and that kind of thing. But uh, so far, we've seen it's been a very beneficial process in some of the other uh, virtual implant trains that we've been doing, especially steam and energy management. So it's definitely something that people can get a lot of value from. Great, thank, thank you, Bruce. And uh, for those of you who are wanting to follow up, you will see that Kyle kindly put the contact information there for Kieran. So uh, feel free to uh, take up his offer and get in touch with him if you want more. And, and thanks for, for the extra input, Bruce. 
Very good. Well, um, it is time to move along to our next speaker, um, who will be Josh Summers from Voltia. And um, this now goes back to one of the, uh, the innovative tech DI technology and its applications. Uh, so, uh, Josh, if you would like to uh, share your screen and go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Hi. Uh, right. So, can you all hear me and can you all see me? Yes. Or yes. See you. the slides more, more accurately. Both, so, uh, actually. <laughs> <I'll>, uh, <laughs> perfect. Without further ado, let's, uh, let's go on then. So, firstly, Alan, thank you for organizing this once again. Um, and everybody, thank you for taking time out of your day uh, to spend some time with us and spend some time with me. So I've punched a timer. I've got 20 minutes and then five minutes of questions. So we'll see how much of this we can crunch through. Uh, welcome everybody again. I'm Joshua Summers and uh, I lead sales for Voltaire. And I'm going to tell you, well, introduce you to our membrane capacitive deionization technology and then also walk you through either two or three applications, depending on how fast I talk. And how far I get through will depend whether we make it to beer o'clock and I talk about um, some breweries. Two things about me you may have picked up. I'm British, so that explains the accent. I hope you can understand me. The second thing, I'm fairly high energy and I talk quite quick and I'm probably going to wave my hands around. So hopefully I won't just blast through everything too much. And uh, if you have any questions, definitely punch them into the comments and we can pick them up at the end or uh, you can contact me after. So firstly, talking about what is CAPDI and then we're gonna go into some of its advantages. So what is CAPDI? So membrane capacitive deionization is a technology that we have developed that you can use to remove TDS, total dissolved solids. So any of that stuff that's dissolved in the water from the water for a whole host of applications from residential home water treatment or softening um, through to cafes, restaurants, breweries to get the perfect beverage into your hand, um, through to industrial applications, cooling towers, automotive rinse line reuse, uh, data centers, really anywhere where you use a lot of water um, in your processes. So how does the technology work? Well. What we do is we take two electrodes. The top electrode, it's made up of a graphoil current collector. We then coat a layer of porous carbon across that, against which we coat a layer of anion exchange membrane. We then on the opposite side have a very similar electrode. Again, the current collector, porous carbon electrode, but this time with cation exchange membrane coated on top. We sandwich those two electrodes together with a flow channel or a spacer in between the two. And then what we do is we apply a very small voltage across that cell. What that will do is positively charge one side and negatively charge the other. Now, either dragging yourself back to work or dragging yourself back to university or school in the periodic table and ions, any iron with a positive charge, so things like calcium, magnesium that are gonna make up hardness, but also your soft salts, so things like sodium, things like arsenic, lead, some of the nasties, those will hold a positive charge. They're gonna get pulled towards and held against the negatively charged electrode. Vice versa, anything with a negative charge, so things like your chlorides, your nitrates, your phosphates, and your sulfates, will get pulled towards and held at the positively charged electrode. This way, as you flow water through and we pull those ions or those minerals, those salts, that TDS out of the water, that's gonna give you a low TDS output. One of the things I think that's cool about the technology is that because we're using electricity in this manner, we can tune it. So you can basically turn up or turn down the current or the power to remove more or less of that TDS. So if you want it in a residential application, you want kind of bottled water quality. So probably about 50 to 100 ppm TDS. We can tune the system to give you that. If you're a barista and you're in a high-end coffee shop, you want about 150 ppm to get good flavor exchange and get the best out of your coffee. We can tune for that. Or you can go to industrial, whether you need less or whether you need more. We can set the system 
the system will apply the correct amount of current automatically to give you that great water quality that you need. You don't need to blend, you don't need to worry about it, you don't even need to worry about fluctuation in the feed water quality. If the water source changes, as in Arizona, either in the summer and winter, they will change water source and it changes quality. The system will account for that to give you that targeted water out from the system. We run as a batch process, so we run in two phases. The first phase is purification, where we're pulling those ions out of the system, then we will need to regenerate. How do we do that? We apply a, we flip the applied potential so that anything that, well, the positively charged electrode, we flip to negative, and the negatively charged electrode, we flip to positive. The result of that is anything that's held against those electrodes will get repelled or repulsed away from them. It will be concentrated in the flow channel, and then we will use a small amount of water to flush that flow channel out and flush that concentrate down to drain. We're not adding any chemicals, we're not adding any salts, like as a salt-based ion exchange softener, where you're gonna regenerate it with a brine. We're just doing it with a small amount of electricity. The maximum voltage across that cell is 1.2 volts DC. So I don't know if back in your school but days you lick the end of a battery, but 1.2 volts isn't very much at all. By controlling the flow rate between purification and regeneration, we're gonna to aim to recover about 85%, if not more, of the water that we're treating. So we're gonna make sure that we get as much water as possible treated into your process and minimize and concentrate up what's going to drain. What do we do with these cells? We take those cells, we stack them up into stacks, we stack the stacks into modules, and then we place those modules onto a skid to form an industrial system. And then we have a number of modules on the skid will be dictated by the quality of the water coming in, the quality or the target water that you have sending out, and then the volume or the flow rate of water that you're treating. Obviously, higher the flow rate, larger the system. On the industrial side, this is a 12 that I'm showing here which is 12 of those modules. Um, we also go from two modules all the way up to 48 modules for some larger systems. If we go above that, then we can duplex those systems together. For the smaller, the coffee shops and the residential, we use a smaller, a smaller module and a single module in a system. So dancing through some of the advantages, I mentioned it earlier, we're using a tiny amount of salt, uh, electricity to regenerate the system. We're not using salt. So for your residential home unit user, as well as the industrials, um, we will remove the hardness as well as overall TDS, and we won't need salt to re regenerate. So makes us a bit more green and environmentally friendly on that side, as well as lower maintenance and lower cost. The tunability I talked to, using the coffee shop, brewery, residential, industrial application examples. High water recovery, again, aiming for that 85 or higher percent. Low energy consumption on a residential softener um, or a residential system, uh, softener alternative, we're gonna be about a dollar a month in electricity to treat the whole home's water. Um, on the industrial applications, we're looking about one kilowatt hour per thousand gallons, um, which compared to reverse osmosis is uh, very, very efficient. We minimize maintenance um, by having everything automated, all the cleanings are automated by the system, um, and that feedback loop to ensure that the system and the water quality is on target will reduce your uh, maintenance on that system. No additional discharge permitting, again, because we're not using um, any salt or considerable amounts of chemicals. So you can generally just discharge our concentrate straight to drain. We are able to connect the systems um, to the internet to allow remote monitoring and logging of data, also any sharing of alarms, um, and also to remote control if needed. So that either we as Voltaire 
all our dealer um, or the maintenance team on site can remote log in rather than having to go all the way to that unit. Modular installation, we touched on the way that with the industrial series systems, we have a number of modules relative to the flow rate and the water quality. More modules, higher flow rate, or we go to more skids. So it's very modular and we can often grow with customers' um, expansion. Tolerant to chlorine, which is quite an advantage compared to reverse osmosis. Um, low fouling potential and we're not affected by uh, silica. So that's my uh, 10 minutes on what the technology is and how it works. Um, now I'm going to spend 10 minutes talking about some applications and giving you a few case studies. So as I've mentioned before, it's fairly broad. We go all the way from the residential unit um, through to light commercial, industrial, do a lot in ag tech, grow houses, cucumbers, food, marijuana, things like that. And then we also have some research systems with universities, as well as very small systems for the use in white goods or appliances. So it's one core technology and then multiple, multiple applications for it. One case study that I'd like to talk to you a little bit about is the recovery of rinse water um, in automotive manufacture. So this number is the number that came up 39,000 gallons per car. When I Googled how much water um, is used in, in cleaning a car or in manufacture of a car, I did have a reference down at the bottom, but I must have deleted at that point. I almost couldn't believe it was true, which is why I thought I had logged where I got the reference from. Um, but either way, even if it is 12,000, which I also saw all the way up to 39,000, it's a lot of water in the manufacture of one car. And a lot of that water is used in the pretreatment um, stages before painting and in the paint line process um, in painting that car. The reason for that is uh, the metal parts as they come through are often dirty or dusty. So they will go through a series of cleaning rinse tanks, like the one, the orangey one is a cleaner that you see in that image down below. They will then dip through two high purity water rinse tanks to clean that cleaner off. They will then, it will then dip into often an etch tank or a pretreatment tank that puts the metal in the right condition to allow the paint to adhere to it. Those rinse tanks going through the process as they process those cars get dirty, at which point that wastewater or that water is sent to waste, which is quite wasteful. It needs treatment and uh, requires a lot of makeups to replenish those tanks. This is where CAPDI can come in, in a very low energy, high recovery, automated manner. Um, we are able to take 70 to 90% of that waste water from line side of those tanks, run it through our process to reduce down the TDS, allowing that customer to reuse that water back either on the line or at the RO. And this slide here dictates. So very simple system. You had tank one, which was picking up the rinse water, goes through a three micron filter to take out any particulates through the Voltaire system dropping that TDS from 800, which was their blowdown or their, their overflow limit, down to around 100, and then back into tank two, and then back into either their process, back into the tank, or to another process such as a cooling tower or a reverse osmosis system where they could then reuse that pretty high quality water. The, um, you can see here the quality down below, in this case, the hardness was around two and we pulled that out. The nitrates were up around 355. We pulled those down to around 40. Sodium, 84, down to 60. Zinc, zinc is very high because it's a zinc-based cleaner that they use in a number of these tanks. Um, up around 185 and then dropping that down to 16. So we're dropping a lot of that TDS or that TDS down to a nice low level where they can then reuse that water because we've improved the quality, saving them money, saving them costs, saving, saving them water. Second case study I want to talk about is uh, cooling towers. So I've just lost my timer, sorry. 
Cooling towers often utilize a lot of water as well. In the way that they work, um, fresh water will come in, they will, it will get evaporated, condensed, evaporated, condensed. During that process, some of that water is lost, um, which will enable that basin to concentrate up and increase in TDS level, at which point they will need to blow that water down or get rid of that water to um, prevent that cooling tower from scaling up um, and potentially becoming corrosive and uh, causing any issues with the cooling tower. Sorry, one of my colleagues is right outside and he's not going away until I wave to him. Um, so CAPDI here um, can be utilized on the makeup water to the system to treat the water coming in. It will improve the quality by reducing the TDS of that feed water, enabling that water to be cycled up more times than previous so that it's making better use of that water, running the cooling tower more efficiently, and then allowing them to use less chemical because when they're putting chemical into the cooling tower to uh, prevent any corrosion, by blowing it down when a low number of cycles of concentration, they'll lose that water, so they have to replenish the chemical as well as the water. By starting the water off with a higher quality, the chemical will stay in the cooling tower for longer. So not only are they minimizing the water that they're making up to the cooling tower, they're minimizing or maximizing the efficiency of the chemical and minimizing the amount they need because it's cycling and staying in the cooling tower for longer, which allows them to reduce the amount of blowdown. So we can improve the efficiency of those cooling towers as well as reduce the makeup water and blowdown that they may need to treat. Again, um, an example here we have is Republic Steel, which is a steel mill up in Ohio. They were burdened with high cost water um, from the municipality for the use in their cooling tower. They wanted to look for an alternative, which was right on their doorstep in the case of the Black River. The issue with that, that is maybe from the name as it's implied, it's not very high quality water. So they would bring that water in, run it through the CAPDI system, we would or run it through a treatment system. We would use a multimedia filter to remove any particulates again, chlorine dosing to remove any bacteria, run it through the Voltaire system to reduce down that TDS, reduce the sulfates, reduce the hardness before sending it into the cooling tower. That way, because the water is much higher quality, they can cycle that water up in the cooling tower, use it for their process at before um, sending it down to waste at the end of the day. And it enabled Republic Steel not only to maximize the efficiency of their cooling tower, but also to move away from a, a costly municipal water source to a river water source, which was much cheaper, but also is putting less of a strain on the resources of the local city and local municipality because they're not using drinking water quality for cooling towers. They're not using drinking water quality for industrial processes. We've got two minutes left. Um, so we did make it to beer o'clock. So the last application I'm gonna talk about is brewing beer, which is, uh, uh, or drinking beer is quite close to my heart. Um, as with most things, uh, when there's too much stuff, too much TDS, too much hardness in the water, it can make brewing coffee, brewing beer, brewing, making tea or food stuffs um, not taste so good because it will over extract flavors or uh, uh, over extract flavors from the hops or give you a scum on the top from hardness buildup that's not good. Um, this is the case up at Wellington Brewery in Guelph where they have very hard water. Um, and we were able to use the CAPDI system to reduce that hardness, reduce that TDS, so that they could improve the quality and consistency of their beer. Talking through some of the Wellington benefits that they saw, because we were giving them a consistent output feed water, they weren't seeing the variation on the inlet, so they weren't seeing the variation in their beer quality, because we were giving them a consistent 
equal quality water for their brewing. They were able to tailor the water so they could um, use it on the lighter beers as well as the darker beers. Lighter beers, pilsners, things like that require less TDS um, because you want less flavor. Heavier stouts require higher TDS because you want more flavor. By being able to use CAPDI to control the water quality, they are able to brew better light beers and better, more consistent heavy beers. One thing that they loved as well, they were able to cut down on their maintenance costs. They went from descaling their hot liquor tank three times a week to once a month because we were dropping down that excess hardness so it wasn't scaling out on their hot liquor tank, enabling them to free up their staff to focus on brewing beer and doing that magic rather than cleaning scale off a hot liquor tank. Um, and also it reduced their costs in those cleaning chemicals, salt, lactic acid, um, and labor in controlling the water in the brew mash. Um, because if there's too much mineral content, again, when you're brewing beer, they have to control that pH. So they need to use more acid. Whereas when they have a better quality water, there's less, less needed there. Benefits that the CAPDI offered them was that dynamic feedback, the automated cleaning, remote monitoring, data collection, and then a very simple, easy to use system that they can just set, forget, and it's gonna give them high quality water day in, day out. Um, for about the past three, four years, Wellington have had that system installed. I won't walk through the water quality because I'm punching over time, but uh, you can pick up two points from that. The TDS coming in at 580, down to 128, and then that hardness, the calcium and magnesium coming in at 118 and 41, which is too high um, for brewing coffee and brewing beer. So they drop that down to 28 and nine, which enables them to get some of that uh, flavor exchange, the sulfate as well, 26, they don't want too much, but you want enough to give you mouthfeel and, and good quality beer. Thank you very much for the time. Um, I probably did blast through that a bit quick, but I hope it was useful. And uh, any questions? I pull up the comments. Yeah, there have been a few questions of that. So um, first one probably is, is relatively simple question. I'm not sure how simple the answer will be, but um, uh, is there a TDS max limit for your technology? And uh, can you indicate what's the highest TDS you're aware of that you've actually treated? So there is and there isn't. Um, someone someone not, thought you would say that. <laughs> there's not per se a max limit um, because there's just a max delta. Like we, we're only able, uh, able to remove a certain amount. So for me, the sweet spot for the way that we've developed the technology is around 15, well, below 1500 ppm TDS. Mm -hmm. That said, we have taken water up to around seven, 8,000 where we take it and we have to just step it down in stages or almost run kidney dialysis style where we mm. just continue to continuously work on that water to bring the TDS down. It's an interesting one because also you can flip side the technology in that often I talk about removing TDS to give you low quality or low conductivity, low TDS water. But also we have some applications where we actually want the concentrate so we work hard to remove and concentrate speciality irons up for, for whatever application they may be needed for. Great. Um, quick question from Jack. Um, have you treated water for boiler operation to generate steam? We have. With boilers, you need to be a little bit careful because depending on what the boiler is, you may need to remove the hardness down to very, very low levels. Cap the eye in its nature is not like RO. RO is going to remove everything, um, but you're going to have high energy, high water wastage, and quite high maintenance. A salt-based softener will exchange all that hardness, leaving you soft salts, but no hardness, but still high TDS. Cap the eye will use electricity to remove the TDS down. Generally, I wouldn't take it below 50 ppm for efficiency purposes. What that does allow us to do though, is pair with other technologies. If you do need very, very pure water, you could always put a mix bed on the backside of the CAPDI and the efficiency of that's gonna be much higher. 
because the CAP BI system will have done the bulk TDS sure. reduction. So the long answer um, is yes and no um, for those <laughs> reasons. But yes, we have done boiler water makeup. Actually, uh, Elise had a question related to this. I'll just mention it. Um, what are the feed water quality requirements? Um, low, um, low T, uh, what are the feed water quality requirements for low TSS, she asks. So maybe, so maybe, TSS, that, we yeah. generally ask for around under 20 ppm. Okay. Um, really, I'd want to understand wh where the TSS is coming from. Mm -hmm. Our spacer is around 180 micron, so it's a fairly large spacer, so we can tolerate some level of TSS, but we generally want to handle it on pre-filtration. But feel free to ping me uh, a message to my email, and I'm more than happy to give you a more, more uh, detailed answer. Right, and just, uh, just quickly, what time for one more? This uh, first question from Dave Anton. Um, he says, TOC and silica, is the rejection rate the same as for typical TDS in water? So, uh, so unfortunately not. So TOC and silica are both uncharged. So we would have to take them out with either pre-filtration or post-filtration. We would mm -hmm. not remove them. Also, they would generally not clog or cause any fouling for the system, they would just flow through. Okay, and then a follow-up question there, will this technology be effective as a brine concentrator? I'm going to your question about concentrating things up, like RO, reject water, recover 60% is what he basically follows that so, up. So <laughs> the easy answer is to say no. The longer <laughs> answer is yes, we do actually do a certain amount of um, RO reject concentration and RO reject for recovery to improve the uh, performance of reverse osmosis systems. So okay. it's generally not our bread and butter in that the core technology generally we put towards residential um, or food and beverage and industrial purposes for the makeup water, generally in lower, lower TDS. But we do have a number of applications where because we are very efficient from an energy standpoint, comparing us to a recovery RO system we, it's definitely worth a look. And okay. without giving too much away, we work with one very large beverage producer doing RO reject recovery. So they definitely find us interesting. I know there are one or two more questions. Maybe you and Dave in particular need to communicate here, but uh, I, I do need to move on because we have another meeting following this. But thank you so much, Josh. Excellent presentation and uh, good discussion at the end there. Uh, so let me, uh, yep, thanks a lot. Let me see if I can share my screen again, just to bring this into a landing. Um, let's see if we can launch. Okay. So um, thank you for the presentations. And uh, we're now at a point where those of you who would like your PDH certificates, uh, the link is here. And uh, I've seen one or two people have already got there, so it is working. So go ahead and uh, follow the link and claim your PDH certificate. Um, thanks for joining us for, for this water forum. Uh, but now um, uh, looking forward, our next main TEEP event, our main uh, public TEEP event will be the uh, uh, second energy forum of the year, which will be held at the AICHE Southwest Process Technology Conference and this would be September 30th, October 1. But the, the energy part will, will be on September 30th. And uh, all things um, being well, as one hopes, this will be in person at the uh, Houston Marriott Sugarland. So um, that is certainly the intent, that is certainly the expectation, but obviously we're um, living in a world of uncertainty, but that is our goal. Um, the conference itself is still in planning, so there's no detailed information out for it, but we will be updating our TEEP website as more information becomes available. And then just moving ahead, um, we will be leading into the uh, uh, STS AICHE monthly meeting, which will be starting at 6 p.m. And if our timer is right here, that gives you about five minutes for a bio break or whatever else you need to do between now and then. So thank you everyone again for joining us. Uh, I think this has been, a, we've had some great speakers. I hope you found this as interesting as I have and um, look forward to seeing you again soon at our next event.